explain uh, why that journey was necessary and why I call it the Carnival Way. So I'm going to start by giving you an overview of wilderness, of the wilderness act, and what wilderness means. Why it matters. Hello? Raise your hand if you read a fan comic almanac. Wow, that's like 
um, I don't know if you're aware, but he was directly responsible for creating the first federal wilderness. It was the Gila Wilderness, and he was the uh, assistant um, forest supervisor in that region. He had just gotten a master's degree. Well, he got it in, in, um, in 1909. He was the second graduating class from Yale in the College of Forestry there. And his, um, it was a, a school, a program founded by Gifford Pinchot, who was very, very wealthy. And it was to manage forests and gain that science. So he, um, the graduates from that program, immediately got very high-ranking positions in the Forest Service, who was an agency that wasn't even 20 years old at the time. And so he became the assistant forest supervisor in the southwestern U.S. And he worked, um, I did a bunch of archival research. I looked at all of his correspondence before it was digitized. I went to the um, University of Wisconsin in Madison, and I spent weeks looking at all of his letters. And there's about a decade of correspondence where he was urging that the Gila be protected. And his big concern, you're probably going to find this a bit shocking, um, because it's been so many years, it's been almost a century, his big concern was that all these roads were being built. And that that was going to fragment this amazing place. And he felt that there needed to be a place set aside where, quote, man, um, that's how he refers to people, that man could not bring in machines and cars had been invented and people were starting to have motorized entry into these forests. And he, he wanted to stop it. And he did by establishing that wilderness. So here he is, bow hunting in the Gila. And this was um, after it was, this was 1936 when that image was shot. It's a place he loved deeply. So the Wilderness Act's objective, um, it's, it's a really short law. Like the ESA is about 90 pages long, maybe longer than that. Um, I, I, one of the topics I teach at Oregon State University, I co-teach um, forestry and public policy with Norm Johnson. And, um, the Wilderness Act is eight pages long. It's really short. It just gets right down to business and says, this is how it's going to be. And so it starts out by defining um, what its purpose is. It's to establish a national wilderness preservation system for the permanent good of the people and for other purposes. And those other purposes are defined later on in the document. They include mainly um, aesthetics and recreation. So from the start, they saw it as this very diverse um, network of wilderness areas. So the top image is the Everglades. And um, this bottom image are the, um, I believe that's with the Coral Belt in Colorado. And so, you know, they, they protected a spectrum of different landscapes. And it's part of a trifecta. So it, the Wilderness Act of 1964, um, I'm not going to get into the whole philosophical background of, of the environmental movement, but um, Aldo Leopold really was one of the first voices for protecting nature. But we really got rolling um, with the Wilderness Act. It was like opening up the floodgates. And so there's this trifecta of laws that are incredibly powerful laws. Other nations don't have laws as strong as this. Um, mainly because citizens can sue in the United States and they can't in other countries. But there's the, the Endangered Species Act and the National Environmental Policy Act. And it's an imperfect safety web for nature, but it's a lot more than most nations have. So we're very fortunate to have these laws. This is the Wilderness Act's formal legal definition of wilderness. And I think, well, you tell me what you think. If we were writing this law today, would we describe wilderness quite like this? So, um, where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man, where man himself is a visitor, he does not remain. So, some people say that this is a problem. 
problem philosophically, the idea of separating humans from nature, that in all the Leopold saw humans and nature as being the same thing. But um, if we were writing this law today, it's possible that the language would be a little different with that. Um, setting humans apart from nature rather than saying we're part of nature and we have to learn how to do this right. Um, well, well, still protecting these lands, you know, that really is the trick. So um, I was searching for, you know, what well, the biggest wilderness is where the acreage, you know, that number seems so big, 110 million acres. And, um, and Nick mentioned, and I'm going to show you an image of where I live, but um, that the Bob Marshall is a huge wilderness, and it is. It's a million, a hundred, um, a million nine thousand two hundred and fifty six skirts. Well, it's it's like these are all bigger. You know, this is what we've done. Granted, most of these really big wildernesses are up in Alaska or up in the far north, but there are some huge chunks of land that we have set aside and have permanent protection. This is Death Valley, and I wanted to show that because um, it, it's really a large wilderness, and it, you know, the, the breadth of the, the diversity of the landscape we're providing is enormous. So this is where I live. Um, my our cabin is about a mile down on the other side of that ridge. And it points to a spot on the map. So um, our cabin is bounded by, um, there's a strip of state forest, then some national forest land that is actually protected wilderness. It's, it's a dual basin. And then there's the Bob Marshall wilderness. So that's my backyard. Um, there's other wildernesses that are contiguous to it, so all of them are connected, and that the connection piece is really, really important because this is we have where our cabin is. We didn't know this when we bought the cabin. Um, we have the highest density of grizzly bears recorded anywhere in the lower 48 states, and that's because of all that big space. So um, the total is 2.5 million acres. And it's not a lot when you compare it to some of the Alaska wildernesses, which are 9 million acres in size, some of them 8 million acres, but it's still a lot of big open land. And living here has taught me some profound lessons, the experience of it, um, seeing wolves return to this landscape after being gone for, for many decades. Um, learning that it's very possible to live very peacefully with all those grizzly bears. So I learned a lot about wildness and wilderness and why both matter and why they, and then I became a scientist and learned more about why they matter from a scientific perspective. So it's important when one discusses wilderness, a lot of times people conflate wildness with wilderness or they use them interchangeably and they're related but they're not the same thing. And I think it's useful tonight for me to give you some very clear definitions, and probably most of you are aware of these, but often I hear people mixing these words up. So, um, Gary Snyder, in his book, Practice of the Wild, have any of you read that book? A few of you have. It's an amazing book. Um, it's about our human relationship to the natural world, and it's a little book, and he's an environmental philosopher. It's full of wisdom. And it was written, I think, well, 1990s. So it's, it's not that old. I strongly suggest that you um, read that book. He defines wilderness as a place where the wild potential is fully expressed. A diversity of living and non-living beings flourishing according to their own source of order. So they're basically left to their own devices. Roderick Nash, um, an environmental historian wrote the classic wilderness in the American mind, and I just saw that um, the fifth edition of it has been uh, published recently. How many of you have read that book? So a few more of you. That book is at least 500 pages long. I've read it three times. Um, so that's what happens when you live in a place like that. You start asking yourself questions about what will 
children in a very enlightened manner. And um, it, he goes into all the Leopold and John Muir and, and all of the, um, the development of the environmental movement, but he defines wilderness as a place that produces a certain mood or feeling in a given individual and as a consequence may be assigned by that person to a specific place. So that's an interesting definition. So that's considered wilderness, um, kind of. I don't think it has been designated as wilderness by uh, the Wilderness Act, but that's Chicago. And in Chicago, um, scientists, and one of them is a friend of mine, have this National Science Foundation funding found um, 30 wilderness, what they call urban wilderness areas, and that's one of them. So, um, you know, our concept of what wilderness is is expanding and changing, especially given all the problems that we're facing today, such as fragmentation of landscape, uh, human population that is growing incredibly fast, and climate change. So wild is generally considered a condition, and it's often defined by what it isn't. So again, Snyder called it um, that which fiercely resists oppression, confinement, or exploitation. And with regards to land, the, the wild land, he called it a place where the aboriginal and potential vegetation and fauna are intact, and the landforms are entirely the result of non-human forces. Pristine. Now, this word pristine is kind of problematic today because we've learned that there's really no such thing. That human influences on landscapes are profound and have been here for many, many millennia. So, and with regard to animals, he calls it free to live within natural systems, so not confined or controlled by humans. And all of these things have degrees as well. So this is an image, a friend of mine um, got a, a wonderful interdisciplinary degree in art and anthropology. And this is um, for her dissertation, she wrote a dissertation, but she also, part of her, um, her work, her doctoral work was an art exhibit. And this is one of the um, pieces that she put in there. It's a photograph that she took in another museum. The museum was in Banff, actually, which I'm going to be talking about in a little while. Um, that's a pair of stuffed wolves, and the museum in Banff had this magnificent, huge exhibit on wilderness, and what they used to illustrate wildness, and here's where people like switch the two words, was a pair of stuffed wolves, in case. And she thought that was profoundly ironic. She paired this, so this was in her art exhibit, with this phrase, which, does anybody know who wrote that? Any? Thoreau, yeah. This is probably one of the most misquoted passages. Um, it, it's like it gets misquoted so much. And one of the biggest culprits was Aldo Leopold. That's from the Stan County Almanac. So no wonder there's so much confusion because you read those words in the Stan County Almanac and you make the assumption that that's the truth. Those are the real words because Aldo Leopold wrote them, but he misquoted it. And it was, it was accidental, it wasn't intentional on his part, although some people have been debating whether that could possibly have been intentional. And then here, in wellness is the preservation of the earth, so seek the wolf in thyself, that's Metallica. <laughs> <laughs> um, these, these words like the row have had lasting impact, and they have great impact today as we're dealing with things like climate change. And I'm going to explain how that works a little bit more. So um, this is another image I took, and that's in Alaska. And um, it really looks like that. I took that from an airplane. We were radio tracking wolves. Um, no Photoshop, no nothing. That's what the landscape looks after. This was taken about three weeks after snow melt. So, um, this is why wilderness matters. The human population has now exceeded 7 billion. We're dealing with all of those people are carving out land into smaller and smaller pieces. And here's why that Wilderness Act is so important. 
And climate change, we um, passed about three weeks ago 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide. That's, that is a, a critical threshold. Some scientists have warned that once you pass that threshold, it's at the point of no return. So, um, you know, this, all of that combined creates a situation where these big intact lands are crucial to our well-being as a species and to the well-being of nature. So I'm going to talk about the science. You know, what happens in these big lands? Why do they matter? Well, these big lands, and I'm going to be showing you a lot of maps, um, these wildernesses are wild because they harbor carnivores. And in the maps, you'll see that there's an overlap between federally protected wilderness and where the carnivores are. And that's the carnivore way. So let's talk about what carnivores do, what their role is. They're keystone species, and a keystone species is a top predator that has a preferred prey species, and it controls that animal, like a wolf with an elk is an example. And if there are no wolves, then the elk um, are very dominant individuals in their trophic, that means food, in their trophic flats. And so they start over consuming and, um, resources and out competing the other animals in that system. So this is an image that I love, and I get a lot of comments on this, Nick. It's from Kara. It was the cover of Kara in that issue in which um, they profiled um, Bill Ripple and Bob Eshta's work, and I had um, a little piece on Red Owl Mountain in there. But it's a, this image is such an amazing image because it, pro it, it depicts that relationship. So just by being present, something like a wolf touches things like butterfly abundance. And I'll explain how that works. These relationships have been written about a lot. There's some um, really great articles. I suggest that you um, you can find this article, this Kara article, High Alert by Lee Sherman. Um, it's online. Um, the Wolf's Tooth is all about these relationships in ecosystems worldwide with a whole spectrum of species, not just wolves, but just a little piece of that book. And um, this other book, Trophic Cascades, for you scientists in the room, it's a very, it reads like a bunch of um, journal articles, but it has amazing science in there about trophic cascades. Again, in systems worldwide with a variety of keystone species. And then there have been more recent articles in science, one by S.D. Goodall, another one by Bill Ripple and his colleagues about what happens when we remove these carnivores. Why that's creating an ecological meltdown. So I'm going to give you this briefly. I wasn't going to put this in here, but because you got quizzed on this, I think it's fair to explain this. Um, some of you have heard me talk about trophic cascades, have seen this, this slide before. These are the basic building blocks that are fundamental to any ecosystem anywhere on this planet. So you have energy, plants, you have herbivores, and then you have the meat eaters, the predators. So there's a hypothesis that energy in the system, in any ecosystem, primarily flows from the bottom up. That's a bottom up view of the world. So without the sun making plants grow, we would never get the top predators because the plants feed the predators food. So this flow of energy is from the bottom up. The alternative perspective is that the world works from the top down. So if you remove those large predators, the herbivores explode in number, they overeat their food, and, and the system starts to become really diminished. And so when you have something like fire, that is a bottom-up force. It causes plants to sprout more vigorously in fire adapted systems. Um, that makes energy move through the system more rapidly. But also, the act of predation creates food for a lot of other species. So, Community structure, we call ecosystems communities, is shaped both from the top down and the bottom up. It's not an either or situation. And there, there are circumstances where something like the wolf may have a lot more powerful of an effect than something like the amount of moisture, uh, amount of precipitation, let's say. 
And here's an, this is an image that a friend of mine took in Yellowstone last year. So, but the story goes that some wolves um, killed, killed a bison, I believe, and then the whole world showed up to feed. And bison are pretty big critters, so this went on for a number of days. And so here's the wolves are trying to reclaim their meat. And look at the, look at the posturing of this particular bear. Look at that body language. So, um, and it, Yellowstone is so wide open that landscape that you can observe all of this stuff really easily um, from a very safe distance. This is a shot with a long lens, of course. But so carnivores. Now, here's why they matter. They provide food. They feed the rest of, of that community. They help create habitat for who knows how many species. We've only touched the tip of that iceberg. We look at things like there's more songbirds where there are wolves because wolves control elk and that helps the, the plants that make the habitat for the songbirds to grow, you know, to grow above the reach of elk. But what about all of the insects and what about things like fungus and what about what goes on in the soil? So, you know, wolves and other keystone predators and all kinds of systems touch everything. And that increases biodiversity tremendously. So there's science like John Turborg found in South America that a system that has apex predators has 90% more species in it, than a, including things like songbirds, than a, than a system that has no apex predators in it. So a more biodiverse system is going to be a lot more resilient to climate change. Remember that 400 parts per million that we threshold that we've crossed. So we are, um, how many of you have read Fulbert's book, The Sixth Extinction? This is a book that I highly recommend. Um, she wrote Field Notes from a Catastrophe about climate change in 2006. And um, The Sixth Extinction is really about what we're doing to the Earth. And most scientists conservatively estimate that by the year 2100, 50% of the species we currently have will be extinct, primarily due to climate change, but also due to fragmentation of their habitat. So these are all very compelling reasons why, where do we have these impact processes? Well, it's in these wilderness areas. So here's the carnivore way. It goes from Alaska all the way to North Central Mexico, it's a pathway that was opened up during the last glaciation when these two ice sheets melted, and then all these species that recolonized the area that was formerly covered by ice um, followed that pathway. And it's the pathway that carnivores use today as they're recolonizing the landscape. And I wrote about this in my book, The Carnivore Way. Um, so let's focus on this corridor here. These are the carnivores that are present in that corridor. And this is a map created by Curtis Edson. He's an um, alumnus of the College of Forestry. Um, and he went on to war. Um, he was in the Middle East. And when he came back, um, we corresponded. And I sent him books about carnivores um, to keep him, his mind on other things. And when he came back, he created the maps in the carnivore way for me. Um, he, was also, he was awarded the Bronze Star for his work over there. But anyway, many of the maps I'm going to show you he created. He's an amazing individual. You can see, though, all of these creatures have a different um, marker for them. And where you get them all overlapping the most is along this pathway. So um, this is an image of a bear that I took in British Columbia, close where we see. And, um, that's a place where humans have decided to um, coexist pretty peacefully with these grizzly bears, and that, that story is in the carnivore way. But um, what I started to see as I traveled that corridor, and what I learned in my Montana home really applied to the whole corridor, is that these carnivore species are all, they all have certain things in common. They're all solitary. They have very low reproductive rates, except for wolves. So wolves are not solitary and don't have a low reproductive rate. They're kind of an exception. Um, they make long distance dispersal. So a dispersal is different than a migration. A dispersal is when an animal leaves home, just like, like human teenagers leave home, right? They, they hit 18 and they want to go somewhere else. Well, that's what these carnivores do. And they go somewhere else and find a mate and establish their own territory. And the reason for that has to do with um, dispersing their genes. You know, it's part of survival of that species. It's an instinct that they have. So biggest threats to them are climate change.
then that is a, a healthy intact system, we think. That we consider that animal, that grizzly bear, as, a, as an indicator or an umbrella species because if it's present, a lot of other things will be present. Like there won't be a million roads. She will have room. She's a female grizzly bear of some species and nurse nursing cub. She had a cub with her. Um, so nice with that image. Um, she will have whatever needs she has to live well and thrive. And that means um, a significant amount of open land. So these are some, we call it the rewilding, um, this dispersal of these carnivores and you know the wildness that they bring to systems. See, these are just collared wolves. And this is um, Bradley with the Center for Biological Diversity just created this map. And these are dispersals made over a 30 year period. And you can see, some of these are astonishing, like look at this, right? Um, here's a wolf that dispersed from Yellowstone into my study area. I was doing research in Colorado. So and that was like about a thousand kilometer dispersal. So, and then there's, there's other dispersals besides wolves. These are, um, this is just a, made by the Colorado Division of Wildlife. These are all carnivores that have dispersed to or from Colorado. So this is a snapshot. These are only the animals that had collars. Can you imagine what all the others might be doing that we just don't know about? And that's OR7. And I was talking to somebody in the audience that we need some updated OR7 maps because what we have are kind of cobbled together. Um, so this is OR7's journey as of 3 1 2012, dispersed from here, north, northeast to extreme northeast Oregon, ended up in California. How many of you have heard the news about OR7? Yeah. yeah. Well, so here's, here's his route in California. And these are images taken of him with a trail camera. And then Carter Neumeyer took that image of him running through the sage. He proceeded to be like a perfect wolf. Didn't kill any cattle, you know, and, and there are ranchers in California that are saying, well, if we, if we might as well have wolves in California, at least we have a wolf like him. Here are his pups. And that image was taken about a week ago by ODFW very carefully so as to not disturb them. And um, so now, the same day that these pups were photographed, um, wolves got um, protection by the California Endangered Species Act, PESA. So they're protected in California. So these are Curtis's maps. And we're working on a paper um, for a scientific journal um, in which we are looking at you know, different people's versions of what the ranges are of these species. Um, the, when you see these marks like that, that's the range that I have come up with after doing an extensive literature review and interviewing a lot of people. But that's I'm going to go through these really fast, but the main thing I want you to see is it's that western corridor where most of them occur. So um, this is cougar. That's the grizzly bear. And now there's there's some disagreement among experts about exactly what what you know, but um, generally what I want you to do is just kind of squint your eyes and see what the trend is. That's jaguar. This is lynx. Now lynx has probably the biggest distribution of all. And that's the wolf. That's a wolverine. And uh, we know who wolverine this is over here. So <laughs> that's a, um, the wolverine that was first identified in that region is um, from Hades Project. So this is what I call the geography of hope. This is really, um, Curtis is working on a map for me where he's overlapping wilderness, moving out of the layer with all these carnival layers. So these, this is wilderness. This is where the wilderness lies. And they're coded based on the different ownerships. So all of those colored polygons are all um, wilderness protected under the, um, the Wilderness Act. And you see it's primarily Here's the carnival way, right? So it's it's the west. And as you go over here, there isn't anything there. And if you 
you look, if you remember the um, carnival maps I just flashed by, you know, where were there mazes? Were there any that were maintained here? Not really. So you start to see this connection between wilderness and these big, fierce animals that create healthy ecosystems. If it, all of those animals, I have a whole other series of maps that show what their condition, their status, their population, their range was um, like 60 years ago. And they were virtually extinct from the lower 48. So now you saw those nice maps where it shows how well distributed some of them are becoming in the lower 48. And their distribution is, you know, it's, where are the wild things? Well, where the wilderness is. And so if, if we know that they are so critical to the healthy functioning of ecosystems, then their survival depends on these intact wild landscapes. So I'm going to give you a little population ecology lesson. Um, these, these figures, I don't know if you can see them from the back, they're all grizzly bears. Okay? So this is Banff National Park. So um, population ecology, and um, we look, first we start with the individual organisms. So that would be one grizzly bear living in Banff National Park. From there you go to the local population level, and at each level you're talking about genetic diversity that enables the persistence of the survival of, of that population for 100 years or longer. Um, at the local population, you're talking about all the grizzly bears in one valley, one discrete valley in Banff National Park. The meta population is, is all of Banff and all the grizzly bears in Banff, and they're not exactly well, they're somewhat connected, and this is what connects them. It's this matrix, right? And if this matrix is not permeable, if there's human roads and, and towns and things like that, then you're not going to have genetic connectivity between these populations, and they will go extinct because they need to be connected. So you have to consider it's a matter of scale, local, regional, landscape, and continental, and this is one of my study areas. Um, this is near the U.S.-Canada border in Alberta. That's where I've been doing wolf studies for a number of years. And here's the crown of the continent. Back to that map I showed you of where I live. Um, 28 million acres. It contains so 17 carnivore species, and all of them, none of them were reintroduced. They've always been there. They were almost extinct, some of them, but when we quit killing them, they all came back. And so 17 carnivore species, how, how many carnivore species do you think there are in Yellowstone? Any guesses? Some say 14, some say 15. So this system is a heck of a lot of a lot wilder than Yellowstone is. We didn't have to bring anything back. We just let them do their thing. So um, this is, there are other maps I'm going to show you, but it's this white outline. It goes from Missoula down here to Banff up there. Here's the U.S.-Canada border. Here's British Columbia, Alberta, and Montana. Okay, that is the crown of the continent ecosystem. I'm going to use an example from it of how we are protecting connectivity for these carnivores. Um, the Banff Wildlife Crossing Project. And it's a multi-phase project that began in the late 1970s um, to mitigate, to uh, reduce the number of vehicle wildlife collisions on that road. Um, they used to call that the meat maker. Um, People called it that, and managers called it that. There were so many collisions. So the, the Trans-Canada Highway, Highway 1, is just like um, Interstate 5. It gets that same volume of traffic, and it ran, it runs right through the middle of Banff. So 2011 is the PI. Um, eventually, they constructed 39 crossing structures, and they've been monitoring um, what wildlife are doing, what animals are using these structures since 1990. And yes, there have been 160,000 successful crossings in 15 years. Here's what they look like. This is a photograph. They're gorgeous. And um, humans are not allowed here, but I, was, I went on here with park managers to experience this, and it's totally quiet up here, and it's filled with game trails. 
So the benefits are that these um, improve and maintain genetic diversity. They help animals adapt to climate change as climate is shifting um, the amount of snow that's present. It helps them move to its, its corridor. So you remember that matrix I showed you? This is the matrix. And it's creating, because of this, it's, it's improving and increasing ecological resilience. So here are some images. Um, this is Bear 64. She's a very famous bear, and that was the same bear in the her previous slide. Um, she managed to have four litters of cubs, and it's because of these crossing structures, because prior to that, um, there was such incredibly high mortality of grizzly bear cubs. They would be hit by vehicles all the time. There's a bear, there's culverts, and there's overpasses. So there's a bear and a culvert. Here's a, a mother cougar with her three cubs. And there's a lynx. So, you know, there was a lot of pushback from the public because these were paid for with taxpayer money in Canada, and they cost many millions of dollars. And Canadians have totally embraced this because they work. Here's a wolverine. Um, cross the road, and then they, that's a beaver that's been um, put up on a tree with, with a bunch of barbed wire. And the whole idea is that it's leaving its hair on the, on the barbed wire as it scavenges the beaver carcass. And they're doing DNA testing on all of these critters that you saw to see if, if the structures are really working to maintain genetic connectivity. So there's a video um, I want to show you. And this is from the trail cameras. So if you could start it for me, please. So these are, um, all of these crossing structures have cameras on them. And that barbed wire is only there to collect hair. And it's set up pretty loosely, so it doesn't provide such a solid barrier. Um, and this is, this is time-lapse photography. So these are the remote Reconnex trail cameras, and they're just running the images like a film. You're going to see some amazing animals using these. So this is all in map. I've got a wolf run after that. Are you in? Um, this is 
John Weaver's work. He's been working on connectivity issues in the current town of the continent for 20 years now. He's with the Wildlife Conservation Society. He's been looking at, um, there's other bottlenecks in here. So Banff is up here, right? This is right here where this image is. I took that image from my helicopter. I was radio tracking elk. Um, so it's right in here where I took that image. And this is a community about the size of Corvallis, but this again is, is Highway 3, which it gets also about as much volume as, as Interstate 5. So those are the two major highways through all of Canada. That's it. Highway 1 and Highway 3. There's no other way to get from point A to point B. And so it's just like how Highway 5 corridor works here. There aren't a lot of alternative routes. And here, because you have all these big mountains, there aren't very many back roads. So um, he's been working to measure the permeability of this landscape for, um, he's worked on the six focal species. I'm just going to show some of his um, analysis, the GIS analysis with Wolverine. And he rated it in terms of conservation value. So um, this has to do with, Connectivity, basically, he coded it as you know very high to moderate, and so you can see where the red areas are that need work. And um, here's another research. This is based on um, two different researchers' data from Radio Collar and Wolverine. And so he used a couple of different um, types of modeling to determine you know what what is how permeable is this landscape, and where are the areas where Um, so, the town of the continent probably, um, it has a variety of mixed land ownership. And in this next map, you see that, and you can see where they're proposing added wilderness. But probably a good half of it is federal wilderness, like national parks or um, wilderness protected by the Wilderness Act in the U.S. This is Glacier National Park right here. So um, this is some of the proposed wilderness, this stuff right in here. This is a proposed national park. So this is a proposed um, wildlife conservation area that would be managed like wilderness, so protected growth as is possible. Um, this is, doesn't show the whole crown of the continent. It's got whole crown of the continent goes like that. So this is Waterton Lakes National Park is here, and this is an addendum to it that's been proposed. And, and all of this is very science-based. There's also lots of data on here's what grizzly bears are doing, and they've also looked at trout and how you know, it works at the headwaters and the watershed. And they're looking at um, maintaining this permeability of that for a variety of species. And that has to do with maintaining ecosystem services. So that's the proposed national park um, adjacent to, this is my study area, all of this. And so this would be contiguous to that, and this is glacier below. And the only reason this is not protected is because it's um, there's very rich um, mining deposits in there, and um, all, you know, so it has to do with mineral extraction. And they haven't really quite mined it thoroughly yet, and so um, people are fighting really hard, and federal managers are recommending that it be protected. It's a, it really has to do with industry pushing that. So um, this is Gates of the Arctic. That's um, another wilderness, one of the largest wilderness wildernesses in our nation. I'd like to thank um, Curtis Edson, um, who is my partner in the mapping work, and Nick Houtman. Wildlands Network and Y2Y, I strongly suggest that you look them up um, if you're not already familiar with them, but they are organizations that are working really hard to keep the, the corridor open and to have networks with landowners, for example, and industrial um, owners working with federal entities to, in a partnership to maintain wilderness values. And all of these national parks I've mentioned, they all facilitated me, my work, they hosted me, I teach in some of them, I do research in some of them. They're all amazing people. All of the Banff images, for example, the um, Tony Publisher and Park Administrators let me use that material. Um, and they're very supportive of this idea of keeping it open and wild and really um, 
raising awareness of why women in the valleys are so important today. So um, I'm going to ask for the lights up a little bit. I'm going to read a short piece from my book, and then I'll take questions.
fewer species of birds. Wolves, wolverines, cougars, jaguars, mink, and grizzly bears have natural histories that often include long dispersals. In our developed world, landscape scale dispersals are becoming increasingly challenging for all species, but they're still happening. In February 2008, in California, Tahoe National Forest, while being used to conduct a Martin study, Oregon State University graduate student Kate Moriarty's remote sensing camera photographed what appeared to be a wolverine. California's first substantiated wolverine sighting since the 1920s would bring the image created a horror. Scientists began by trying to figure out where did it come from. The nearest known population was about 900 miles away in Washington State. DNA tests of scat samples collected from the animal proved that it was genetically related to Rocky Mountain wolverines and had dispersed from an out-of-state population. In spring 2009, a two-year-old female Yellowstone wolf wearing an Argo satellite collar made an astonishing thousand-mile trek to north central Colorado. Aspen Sound Mountains and deep valleys in that part of Colorado harbor abundant food for wolves, healthy deer, and elk herds. However, it's not very safe to be a wolf in Colorado. Due to low human tolerance for this species, as well as other hazards, this wolf hung out around Eagle County for a few weeks, but eventually died after eating poison intended for coyotes. One of the most compelling long-distance dispersals began in Oregon in September 2011, when a young male wolf left northeastern Oregon's Yamaha Pass. Called the Lark 7 by the Oregon Division of Wildlife, he covered an astonishing range of territory through the state as he moved toward the southern Cascade Mountains. ODFW began posting images of his walkabout, which showed up on their map as a thick, black, zigzagging line. Popularly dubbed Journey, this wolf drew public attention as he wandered around Oregon in search of a mate. Often he looped and doubled back on himself, but each week he sent his farthest south. Just before Christmas, he reached Crater Lake. After Christmas, a public question arose. How far south would this vagabond wolf go? Some wondered whether he was looking for love in all the wrong places. <laughs> right before New Year's Eve, the public got their first answer to that first question. Journey entered California, becoming the first wolf confirmed in the state since 1924. For the next 15 months, he stayed in Northern California and out of trouble. He preyed on deer and left cattle alone, but didn't find a mate. In mid-March 2013, he returned to Southwest Oregon, where he remained through the end of that year. His California travels inspired the state legislature and game commissioner to consider putting the wolf on the state list of threatened and endangered plants and animals, and to begin creating a management plan for this species. And I've been um, intimately involved in that effort. I'm one of the peer reviewers that the state has reached out to to help advise them about that process. So I'm currently working with them on a management plan. These transboundary stories make our hearts beat a little faster and give rise to complex emotions, wonder, grief, hope. How many other such dispersals of which we are unaware have there been? Why do so many have tragic endings? And how can we improve the outcomes now that we're aware that these dispersals do occur? Audacious as such dispersals may seem, some animals can't help making them. This behavior is imprinted in their DNA, in the shape of their bodies, and in how their minds work. Moreover, they do it with Grace, as if such heroic dispersals amount to just another day in their lives. There goes a wolf loping a thousand miles in a harmonic energy conserving gait, its hind feet falling perfectly into the tracks left by its front feet. And the wolverine, effortlessly running up mountains and back down in minutes, covering more ground and elevation more rapidly than any other terrestrial mammal. If such behavior were a simple act of will, most of these stories would have happy endings. But nevertheless, these dispersals fill me with hope that perhaps we'll soon get it right, given the opportunities and powerful lessons these animals are providing.